Welcome to the December program of the Dr. Harold C. Deutsch World War II History Roundtable and um, a commemoration, commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge veterans that were in the Battle of the Bulge. Could you stand up as Keep, 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 uh, keep, keep standing. Keep standing. Keep, keep standing. Uh, could other World War II veterans stand up? Thank you. Now I'm going to sit down. Thank goodness. I've done the first four programs. And Doug Becky, Doug, why don't you come forward? Doug is the curator at the uh, uh, Camp Ripley uh, Museum. And uh, I, uh, great historian, and uh, we appreciate you organizing the program this evening. Tonight we have two historian speakers, and then we have two veterans who will be speaking about their first person accounts of uh, the Battle of the Bulge. One is Jim Carroll, who served in C Company, 1st Battalion, 501st, Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st. And the second is Herb Seweth, who served in E Company, 2nd Battalion, 506th of the 101st. Uh, they'll be speaking about their first person experiences in Bastogne. And honorable mention tonight to Ray Nagel, who won't be on the veterans panel, but Ray served in the 321st Glider Field Artillery uh, Regiment or battalion, and uh, supported the 506th at Bastogne. So uh, thank you for being here, Ray. We'll start our program tonight with our authors, historians, uh, talking about their book detailing the Christmas fighting around Bastogne. The first speaker is Leo Barron. He works for General Dynamics as an instructor of military intelligence officers for the US Army at Fort Huachuca. He holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in history and has served with 101st Airborne. He served two tours uh, on active duty in Iraq as an infantry and an intelligence officer. His articles about Bastogne and other World War II related military topics have appeared in Infantry Magazine, World War II History Magazine, Military Intelligence Professional Bulletin, and World War II Magazine. He's used some of his research on Bastogne and the Christmas battle to teach his students about intelligence preparation of the battlefield. Our second historian speaker, the co-author of the book, is Don Segan. He studied military history for decades. He worked as a reporter for the Douglas County Daily News Press. In addition, he's worked as a freelance writer for several years in Colorado with articles published in the Parker Trail, the Denver Business Journal, and other publications. During Operation Desert Storm, he performed public relations work for the US Army. His degrees are in journalism and communications, and he currently works as a secondary school history teacher. So we'll start out with Leo Barron, so please welcome Leo. Looking at this map, and the reason why I put this map up is to show kind of, you know, the general idea of what Europe looked like, and uh, not at 1945, but just kind of where, where we're talking about here. And in that little uh, square there is basically the area of operations of the uh, US Army, uh, 12th Army Group. And of course, right in the center of that is this little town, you might have heard of it, um, called the town of Bastogne, all right? Now, this map here is actually the situation map from the 12th Army Group uh, on the morning of 16 December. You can actually get this online. It's pretty cool. You can download these from uh, the National Archives. As you can see here, this is Antwerp, all right? And Antwerp was what Hitler wanted to get to. Uh, by this time in the war, most of the Allied supplies came through Antwerp. Uh, it had fallen, and they had recently opened it up in November of 1944, and the fuel, the ammunition, all the things that you needed to fuel a war machine was coming through the port of Antwerp. And the Germans understood this. And so it was Hitler's plan to actually cut through the Allied lines, take the port of Antwerp, and there 
thereby deprive the Allied armies of the necessary gas and ammunition. Now, if you notice here in these two blue boxes, all right, you see all these little black rectangles. Those are actual Allied and German uh, divisions. That's the disposition of all those divisions. Okay, and as you notice up here, you've got first U.S. Army, and then of course you got uh, Patton's Third Army down here. And as you notice right here, there's not a lot there. In fact, there was only about four Allied divisions. And what was the plan was from Eisenhower and Bradley and, and the other Allied uh, generals in the Allied High Command was, we don't think the Germans are going to do anything in the Ardennes. All right? So they're going to leave it alone. And therefore, we can have a few divisions there for uh, retraining, refitting, uh, for new divisions that are being incorporated onto the line. Because the thought process was in November and December of 1944, that the German army was finished. And this was a, almost like an R&R &R area, if you will. All right, and so that's why there were only four German, uh, excuse me, four allied divisions in that sector. Well, the Germans knew that. And so that's where the German plan was. They were gonna penetrate the allied lines in the Ardennes with that nice big huge arrow there. And they were gonna cut through the allied lines and go all the way to the port of Antwerp. Now, the extra added bonus of that, of course, is Hitler would then trap all of these Allied armies, just like he had done with the uh, British Expeditionary Force and force the French Army in 1940, and trap them north of the, uh, the German penetration, and thereby, of course, cause all kinds of problems, possibly another Dunkirk situation. So that was the German plan. As we know now, it was probably unrealistic, but at the time, it made from at least a strategic sense. It did make sense. If they had captured Antwerp, it would have probably set back the Allied war effort by probably you know, 12, 18 months uh, as a possibility. So here was the German plan. And if you've actually seen the book, this is actually uh, one of the maps from our book. And here's Antwerp, way up here, up north, all right? Six SS Panzer Army, which was under the command of uh, Sepp Dietrich, they were, as we like to call in military parlance, they were the decisive operation. They were the ones who were supposed to break through the Allied lines and get up to Antwerp. Fifth Panzer Army, okay, under the command of Hasso von Manteuffel, they were the first shaping operation. Their task was to secure the southern flank of Sepp Dietrich's army as well as take Brussels and then move on to Antwerp uh, from the south. And then last but not least, we've got the poor red-headed stepchild. We've got the 7th Army down here under the command of General Brandenburger. And their task, in reality, was to make sure Patton's 3rd Army doesn't cause any problems. And not, you know, for those of you, I'm not going to steal the show from tomorrow. For those of you who want to know more about that, I'll talk more about that tomorrow, but not tonight. Now. Highlighting these two red boxes is Bastogne and the town of St. Vith. Even early on in the German planning, the German planners understood that these two towns were vital pieces of terrain because of the fact that if you've been to the Ardennes, it's heavily wooded. And as we like to call it in military parlance, severely restrictive terrain, especially at this time. You're not going to travel off the road. You know, you've got the heavy woods, especially in November and December, it's going to be muddy. All right. And the Germans understood that road travel was everything. And therefore, those two towns were essential for them to capture as early as possible in order to be able to move further on to the Meuse River up here. Okay? And so Bastogne, which is right there, as we you know, know, it had seven roads going in and out of it. And so that's why the Germans said early on, okay, 5th Panzer Army, you need to capture Bastogne as soon as possible before you move out to the Meuse River. And so, December 16th, the attack kicks off, okay? And what's fascinating is something that we learned was Eisenhower, even pretty early on, by the evening of the 16th, was actually ahead of his own generals, understood that this was something bigger than just a spoiling attack, which was in the evening of the 16th, that was kind of the common consensus originally was, hey, this is just some big German spoiling attack. You know, the, the, no one even thought, hey, this is going to be a huge offensive. But Eisenhower was in a meeting with Bradley and said, no, no, I think this is something big. 
And it was his decision to activate the strategic reserve, which was this massive reserve of only two divisions. Um, one, of course, being the, uh, the 101st Airborne. And so the 101st Airborne is tasked, and this is a pretty amazing thing when you think about it. They were able to get the order out, issue a warning order, and within you know, 24, 48 hours, the 101st Airborne is getting onto trucks and, uh, and moving out to Bastogne. And even, even in today's day and age, that's a pretty amazing feat that they were able to do that. But that was a tribute to the, to the army that Marshall and Eisenhower had built in Northwest Europe. They could move faster, and they could move more efficiently and more effectively than anyone. The other mistake that Hitler had made was Hitler did this thing what we call in the intel world mirror imaging. Hitler thought that we operated our military the same way that he operated his military, meaning even a division commander would have to go to Adolf Hitler if he wanted permission to move anywhere. And in reality, that was not how he operated. Eisenhower did not have to sit there and dial up Franklin Roosevelt and say, hey, President, you know, can I move the 101st Airborne? He didn't have to do that. He had that authority to move those divisions on his own. And Hitler never actually grasped that concept. So Eisenhower gives the order, hey, 82nd, 101st, mount up, get in your trucks. Oh, by the way, all you other armored divisions that are in reserve, everyone's going to be pulling out and heading to these locations to stop the German attack. And so the 101st shows up here on December the 19th, and this was the assembly area out here in the western section of town. And so that's where they assemble. And then from there, they spread out to the various points along the perimeter. And at one point, this is what the perimeter looked like. Uh, and you see way out here, uh, first of the 401st actually was up here, even as far north as Crossroads X here. They had a, a B company was up here at Crossroads X. And then what ended up happening was over the next couple of days, the Germans were constantly attacking the perimeter, attacking the perimeter, especially out in this area, and shrinking the perimeter. So by the 24th of December, that's what the perimeter looked like, OK? And this is what it looked like on Christmas Eve night when the German attack uh, began, all right? And this is what we're really looking at here in the Northwest sector. This is really what the focus was when uh, Don and I wrote this book. And now we got these evil looking arrows coming in uh, from the Northwest. And this was more or less the German plan of attack. And people have asked me, why did they attack uh, from the northwest. I mean, it makes no sense because, you know, obviously their supply lines and logistic nodes are out here in the east. But if you've been to Bastogne, the reason why they attacked from the northwest is that's where it was very wide open terrain up here. Everywhere else, there's a lot of woods, especially in the north, in the east, and in the southeast here, it's very heavily wooded. But here in the western sector, uh, it's, it's pretty nice rolling hills. And if you've got the sudden addition of an entire Panzer, Panzer Grenadier Regiment with a whole company of Panzers. Tankers, I don't know here, do we have any former tankers here? Any former? You guys like to move around in big open spaces. And so that's the only spot where there's a lot of big open spaces. And so that was why it was decided by the German commanders that they were going to attack from the Northwest Corridor. And so that was kind of where the plan came on that regard. So here we are. Christmas Eve night, everyone's trying to think about their loved ones. Some are going to midnight mass. And what happens? The Luftwaffe decides to bomb Bastogne. And that's, is, you know, that's how we start out the book, uh, with that initial Christmas Eve bombing. Happened around uh, uh, 7 PM, or 1900 hours. And so they bomb Bastogne. Um, it was a sh small flight of about uh, 12 uh, Junkers 88s. They come in, um, and in most cases, they're, they're kind of flying blind. They see what looks like to be a headquarters. It's a building with a bunch of vehicles out in front of it. And that's one of the, vehicle, that's one of the buildings they bomb, which is actually shown very well in the Band of Brothers uh, miniseries. And in fact, it was a hospital. All right, And that's why the vehicles were there. They were ambulances carting soldiers back and forth. It was a hospital that was part of the, uh, the one element of Combat Command B uh, 10th Armored Division that happened to be there. And that was kind of the signal of the beginning of the attack. And then around 3 o'clock in the morning is when the main attack began. So now to kind of orientate you to the, to, the, to the map, here's the town of Champs, 
roll a hem roll and of course you know downtown bastone all these elements here are the u.s elements you got easy company 502nd up here uh, able or i call it alpha company now able company 502nd uh, b company 401st and then uh, a company 401st and then back here in reserve you've got charlie company uh, 401st which was the uh, battalion reserve the division reserve were these two companies right here, uh, B and C Company of the 502nd. That's why 502nd only had one company on the line. But that's an important company, as you'll soon see. So around 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, there's another bombing raid. And there's, then there's this huge artillery barrage. And uh, the, the soldiers talk about it as one of the largest barrages that they underwent during the war. And the Germans sent two battalions of Volksgrenadiers uh, from the uh, 77th Folks Grenadier Regiment, 1st and 2nd Battalion. And this is, was a typical type of German attack. And if you actually look at uh, the German uh, operational manuals that were issued to the uh, U.S. military MI officers, the Germans like to do something with where they would have a fixing force, is what we call it now, and they're going to fix the U.S. forces here. And so when the Panzer uh, thrust, the Panzer Angriff, uh, the Schwerpunkt would come in, these guys would not be able to reinforce or reinforce the, the threatened areas. And so that was the whole point of this attack up here. So the infantry were going to fix this one. It turns out it was only one U.S. company. And you would think with two battalions, you know, more or less six infantry companies against one poor, helpless little rifle company that these guys would take care of this one little rifle company. Unfortunately for the Germans, the one little rifle company was a company of uh, paratroopers from the 101st Airborne. Okay, plan didn't work out as it was supposed to do. These two battalions couldn't quite get the job done, and this one company is able to stop almost two entire battalions. They ended up having a couple TDs come in uh, from the 705th Tank Destroyer Battalion to eventually flush out what few Germans got into Shams. It was about a three-hour battle from like 03 to about 06 in the morning. But uh, Wallace Swanson, who was the company commander, was able to take care of business. Uh, pretty much single hand. There's one uh, machine gunner that we talk about, uh, Corporal Fowler, who, you know, from what he said, there were literally, you know, in front of his machine gun position, you know, bodies of dead German soldiers that he had basically cut up as they were trying to assault his, uh, his one, uh, one machine gun position. All right? So at, by around 06 to 07, this attack kind of peters out doesn't do what it's supposed to do, which is bad, because these guys were hoping that this fight would have gone the Germans' way. Unfortunately, now we got two more battalions, 3rd Battalion of the 115th Panzer Grenadier Regiment and 1st Battalion of the 115th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. They're trudging along thinking that you know, we're already in, in a world of hurt here. Unfortunately, it isn't the case. These guys come trudging along, and it's around 7 o'clock to 7.10 in the morning when these guys actually hit the Allied lines. And the Panzers kind of line up almost, and they break through. And most of this penetration happened in down in Alpha Company's uh, area of operations. Alpha Company was commanded by Lieutenant Bowles, and they break through his company. What was interesting was uh, most of the soldiers basically hunkered down in their foxholes, and they let the German Panzers rumble right on by. And uh, Allen, who was the battalion commander, also put the word out, don't fire on these guys. Just let these tanks rumble on by. Because he knew, you know, what is, what's an M1 Garand going to do to a Mark IV Panzer tank? Not much except really get him angry, I guess. All right? So they let the tanks drive through. Now, you got to remember, at this time, it was still pretty dark. Sunrise is like around 8 o'clock. All right? So it was still pretty dark. Uh, not only that, there was a heavy fog. And so the Germans literally drove right through these foxholes and had no idea that they had already driven through the American main line of resistance, or the MLR as we like to call it. They had no idea. They just literally drove right through. There was a couple guys in their foxholes who were, who were killed. But for the most part, most of these guys didn't fire around. German tanks drive through. They have no idea. And they go up to this area right here. And they literally park themselves, and they overrun Colonel Allen's battalion headquarters. He actually takes off um, with a bunch of papers stuffed in his, under, his, you know, in his, under his armpit. And they overtake the headquarters here. 
and they stop. You know, they're like, hey, we're good to go. We've achieved our intermediate objective. Now we just got to wait for the infantry. They had some infantry on the tanks, but there was a whole battalion of infantry that was supposed to come up behind them and be able to provide additional support. And the German Panzer Doctrine uh, was basically to break through the lines. And the German Panzer Doctrine then said to get to the artillery and take out the opposing force, the defender's artillery. So they stop right here, OK? And then what ends up happening is the infantry from 3rd Battalion start to move forward. They basically f fell behind. And these guys basically get back in their foxholes and start taking out the infantry. All right? And so the infantry from this battalion up here never make it. They're cut down in this area right here. Okay? Charlie Company gets, joins the fray from 1st of the 401st. And these infantry pretty much die all in this area right here. Most of them never make it. Meanwhile, these tankers, these panzer drivers, thinking the battle's done, we actually even have from eyewitness accounts, they start taking out some coffee, start having some breakfast. Literally, they're literally just sitting there, hey, what's going on? Let's have some coffee, OK? Battle's over with. Meanwhile, if you remember here, these two companies pull up, and they assume a battle position up here in this wood line, OK? And not only are they alone in that wood line, but they grab, you know, some things called tank destroyers, M18 Hellcats, to join them. And these guys end up just waiting. And eventually, like a little bit after 8 o'clock, and I'm simplifying it here, these guys, these panzer drivers, all of a sudden realize that something has gone radically wrong. The infantry are lost. No one knows where the infantry is. And they decide, hey, guys, it's time to, uh, it's time to get out of Dodge. And so they start breaking up. And one group starts to head north. And one group starts to head south to basically do what, like I said, the tanks like to go after the artillery. And that's where the US artillery is, the 463rd. And as this group starts to head north, they get wiped out. Almost every single tank gets wiped out. Almost every single tank here, they, kept, they end up, uh, leave it to a, what we call Joe, leave it to a private to grab one of these tanks. They capture one of the tanks. And they start you know, joyriding around with this captured Panzer tank. This group up here. Almost all of them are wiped out. Okay, there's a couple. There's one. There's a couple U.S. tank destroyers that are destroyed in the in the in the in the in the firefight. All right, one Panzer somehow manages to escape up in this wood line up here, and hides for a couple hours, and eventually shows up trying to drive through Shams, and it's eventually destroyed. The the devastation is so complete that Colonel Malka, who was the regimental commander for these two battalions, did not know what happened to his first battalion till after the war. He literally loses an entire battalion. It vanishes, goes into like the Bastogne Bermuda Triangle, if you will. And he has no idea what happened to it until after the war. All right? And so that is more or less, I'm simplifying it, but that's pretty much what happened in the battle for, on Christmas Day. Now, Don's going to go ahead and go over and talk about our methodology and how we came up with some of these uh, assessments and how we came up with how the battle uh, went down. Don? What I thought I would do is I would take what we, uh, Leo and I, call the foxhole eye view. People say, where did you come up with this idea? Where did you decide to go ahead and take a look at the Bastogne battle and specifically Christmas and what was happening in Christmas? So for me, the genesis of No Silent Night came from trying to solve some of the mysteries, as well expanding on a dramatic story that has typically been given short shrift in the World War II history books. Um, SLA Marshall's book, Bastogne, the story of the first eight days, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, handles this story about what happened on Christmas in just a few pages. And uh, there was a feeling there that there's got to be a lot more to this whole battle and to the whole situation that happened that, that eve and then, of course, Christmas morning. Uh, very little that we read, uh, Leo and I, in the way of German accounts or uh, Belgian accounts that had gone into this story, too. And uh, Leo did a great job of describing this the other day we were talking and he said it's like you read a history book and if they only talk about one side that participated in the battle it's kind of like watching half of a tennis game you know it's, it's there's no point to it so to get the other side to find out the german point of view on this battle and then what i thought was really um a crucial part of our book and and really adds a lot too is the belgian uh, civilians and their point of view of what was going on around them uh, during this whole tragic time. 
Christmas is usually a pretty memorable time for most people on military service. I think any of us that have ever served in the military, we know that. And the interesting thing was how clear, crystal clear, many of the memories were of these men that I, I talked with. And they could tell me exactly what they were doing that Christmas Eve. They could tell me exactly what part they played, what role they played that Christmas morning. Um, they might have forgotten other things that happened during their service. They might have forgotten what they had for breakfast that morning, which, by the way, I do, too, you know, sometimes. But they were excellent at remembering exactly what they were doing on Christmas Eve. And I think it's because when you're in the military, of course, you're serving so far away from your loved ones, and that's a very memorable, uh, poignant type of time for you. Um, the more we research, the more we realize that this was the high point of the German effort to take Bastogne. To tell the story of No Silent Night, as you probably already know, uh, Leo and I, uh, both veterans of the US Army, we also traveled to Bastogne. I know I made two trips there, and Leo, I'm not sure how many trips did you? Yeah, the one trip. And uh, we walked and mapped the battlefield. We spent several years extensively researching primary source data from the archives. Um, we've also read letters and accounts from Americans, Germans, Belgians, and interviewed dozens of veterans of the Christmas Day battle as well. Veteran interviews, and uh, those of you who have either participated in these, uh, if you have been interviewed, or if you yourself have done some interviewing, um, I definitely say, please, 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 if you are a, a veteran, if it's something you feel comfortable about, if you can share your stories before they're lost. Uh, because it's, it's priceless. And the fact that, of course, as we know, the time factor, so many veterans are, are passing away from World War II, uh, you know, every day. And so I think it's really crucial to capture this history. As a, as a history teacher myself, and looking at these, these young faces that come into my class every year and thinking, you know, this, these stories need to be told. They need to be carried on for generation to generation. And I think that's really, really important. So anything you can do, or if you have somebody in your family that you can go ahead and interview, um, please do. Um, some of the veterans that we, and some of you I'm sure here may recognize some of these names, uh, Tony D'Angelo, Charles Ace, Carmen Giese, uh, Willis Fowler, Ken Hessler, uh, even a German veteran we had there on the very far uh, right-hand side, Ludwig Lindemann. Uh, and they really added quite a bit to the, to the story listening to these, these accounts from these men. Memories versus data and reports. Uh, one of the things that you get into, of course, whenever you're researching any sort of history is uh, if you have the, the people to interview, matching that up with how accurate are their memories of what happened with um, the data that was uh, recorded, the reports, the after action reports. And it's interesting that I found at least with the, the individuals I spoke with, and again, it may have been because Christmas was such a memorable moment for them in their life, but outstanding, crystal clear memories of, of what they recalled going on. And uh, Leo and I were able to verify you know, much of this by then taking a look at the data and the reports. Now, that's not to say it was perfect. You know, occasionally, there's, there's lapses in memory, but for the most part, spot on. Uh, here's just an account and, and just an example that I thought you might kind of enjoy. Um, and it is rather sad in a, in a way. Uh, Tony D'Angelo, who was a sergeant in charge of one of the uh, tank destroyers that played a crucial role here at the, the climax of the battle. And uh, he was in one of these M18 Hellcats tooling around in this part of the sector where the attack happened. And he gave a, a wonderful account to us about uh, the action that followed up on uh, uh, Christmas morning. But he had uh, talked to me about this incident that we have in our book where he was up near this old shrine on top of a hill. And he said it was outside of uh, Longchamp. And he remembered how he was up on the hill there with um, Wallace Swanson. And all of a sudden, they noticed that the side of this hill was full of German tanks and vehicles. And this was kind of one of the first clues they had that, oh, no, here we go. Something's coming in the northwest sector, and it's going to be coming soon. And while he was up there, he said the Germans spotted him and Captain Swanson, and they started firing a couple of rounds at them. So they got the heck out of there as quick as they could. But he told me, he said, you know, I remember that there was this shrine up there. There was a shrine up there. And I just remember that. And I talked to uh, bundles of people who lived in the area. And I talked with other veterans and could not locate this shrine, looked at maps, uh, looked into books, everything. So. About 
a day before he passed away, uh, he called me from the hospital. And he said, last night I had this incredible moment of clarity. And I remember exactly where that shrine is. And he described it to me. And he told me where it was. And sadly, the next day I got a call from his son. It said that he'd passed away in the hospital. But I took the information he gave me that I had written down. And when I got on the outskirts of Longchamps, I went up there. And sure enough, I found the location of the shrine. Now, this is not the original shrine. It was rebuilt because it was destroyed during the, during the battle around Bastogne. But I found it in the backyard of this one Belgian there, and he was a, a wonderfully accommodating gentleman. He said, come on back and take photographs. And even from his backyard, because that's his kid's soccer goal, you can see there in the, in the photograph on the right. But you can see the hillside in the background that uh, D'Angelo was describing, where the, the German panzers were. So it just shows you how that sometimes that, that clarity from, from the veterans is, is just remarkable. Uh, using interviews, reports, site visit, experiential history, what I like to call experiential history, battlefield forensics, as we sometimes call them. Just one example of research from our book, the armor battle that was fought on the Champs Imrol Road, the 705th C Company tank destroyers uh, versus the 115th Panzer Mark IVs and the Stug Threes on Christmas morning. It started for me with this famous photograph. How many of you have seen this photograph published in books or magazines? Raise your hand if you've seen it. Yeah. It's, it's one of those iconic images from World War II. Uh, reportedly, uh, Patton loved these type of photographs of, of blown up German tanks when he was visiting Bastogne. You know Patton. And, yeah. And this one here, this Panzer Mark IV, uh, I was looking at and I kept thinking to myself, I'd seen it mislabeled in so many books. You know, things that had said, well, this was outside of Noville or this was outside of... Uh, of St. Vith or someplace like that, it had been hit by a bazooka, and I was thinking, mm, I don't think a bazooka is going to do something like that to a, a panzer tank. And uh, the more we research and we look into it, we find out that uh, the pictures, and you can even see the difference in the snowfall from December to January in the um, two images here, the bigger image, and then this one was taken later in January. There's more snow on the wreck. And in the background of this picture here was another one of the, the um, self-propelled guns, these little Stug 3s, that was destroyed by uh, the Americans. And then down the road here, burning in the background with that part of the turret sticking up, was this panzer right here. And so this gave us kind of an area, if you want to talk about battlefield forensics, we could take a look at a map then, and we could start to kind of locate where these wrecks of these vehicles were. And w how they were hit then was the other thing, taking a look at the accounts from the veterans, the data, the reports we have, and then we could take a look at that. So the primary sources, reports we looked at here, interviews with the veterans, the daily reports, uh, the Koskamaki collection. Uh, Leo did a wonderful job of scoring that for us, a, a great amount of interviews, letters, and stuff that was really a treasure trove. Uh, German accounts from the uh, German commanders who were involved, US and German after action accounts, articles, monographs, photographs, and maps. And of course, when you encounter that, when you're doing that research, you encounter conflicts, um, running into uh, multiple sources that may have a different point of view. And we were able to, we feel very conclusively straighten many of those things out. And you know, there's still always going to be some, some gray areas there and some mystery. Uh, the number of German tanks that were involved, uh, we think we've got it fairly well pinpointed down. For many, many years, this had been kind of a, a big thing when discussing this attack on the Christmas morning, uh, that sometimes numbers had been thrown out there. As many as 19, 22 uh, tanks were attacking. And we can certainly understand that in the heat of battle. Uh, the American soldiers are seeing these things overrun the positions, and they're, uh, they're running to, the, to tell their commanding officers, oh my god, here comes you know, an entire regiment of German tanks, or, or what have you. And we were able to kind of determine which 705th tank destroyers were involved, even uh, the crews that were in some of those, those tank destroyers. Uh, the accounts even, we have a fairly good account of who got what, although there's always going to be discrepancies. Somebody's saying, uh, you know, our tank destroyer took out this German tank. And then somebody's saying, no, no, our bazooka men were the ones who stopped it. And, and it, who knows, it may have been both. Uh, 
accounting for a lapse in the attack. Uh, Leo did a wonderful job of taking a look at this, and, and it really made a lot of sense. The more we were wondering why there was this hesitation in the German attack, like he was telling you about, uh, for their infantry to catch up. The armor had penetrated the MLR so quickly, and they were still waiting for this armor. And we know how the, the Germans operated. They were not going to go anywhere with their armor unless they had the, the infantry. And accounting for additional towed tanks in the early morning dark, uh, many of the, the veterans' accounts had described these infantry sleds that were being towed behind some of the panzers and behind some of the, the Stugs, I believe, as well. And you can see a picture of one of these in operation when they were trying to figure out this method of attack, which seems, if you ask me, darn near crazy, if not suicidal, uh, to have all of these guys packed on board these flimsy little wooden sleds and towed behind a tank. But there were accounts that verified this, especially with the 463rd, the artillery unit that uh, hit a lot of these. And we find that that may have accounted for some of this in the early morning dark. Many of these American soldiers saying, hey, you know, we're getting overrun by 23, 24, 25 tanks. Because when you look at this thing, and in the dark, it kind of looks like another little tank following behind this one right here. So. Geography and site visit, as I mentioned, you know, Leo and I have both been to outside of Bastogne. I'm sure several of you have too. And comparing some of the photographs, um, this one right here, we were finally able to pinpoint both of these photographs exactly where they were taken. Uh, this is either uh, Sergeant Adam Wan's uh, TD or um, Schmidt, his TD. And, and, and sadly, of course, their, their TDs were taken out. They were killed. Uh, during this battle, but it's right along the uh, Rive de Mande, which was a, a lane of trees leading into Roly Chateau. And um, Leo was the one that was pointing this out. We were taking a look at this picture of the Stug right here, and you see that hole right there. It may be very hard for, I'm sure, a lot of you to see from back there. But we're, uh, I remember I originally was saying, I wonder what that was. And, and uh, Leo was saying, well, that, that's definitely penetration from an armor armor penetrating round there that went in through this armored skirt on the side. And there was really, we don't know what the other side of this vehicle looks like. We can't find any real good close-up photographs of it. But what we do know is, according to the geography, when we look at the maps and we look at the um, uh, aerial photographs, that it lines up almost exactly with where these tank destroyers were. So this is you know, not obviously to scale, and it's not in proportion here, but this is kind of the uh, representation here, is they were over here firing and obviously got a flank shot on that thing. Uh, taking photographs as I did, I also enjoyed going into these woods where the tank destroyers were and trying to get kind of a first person view. What would they have seen? And uh, what would that have looked like? And then I was kind of playing around on uh, PowerPoint here trying to figure out what they would have seen when these tanks came topping over this hill trying to penetrate their position. So when there are still questions, and this is where I kind of talk about experiential history a little bit, uh, a couple of things that I kind of do, and I, I press some of my students to do as well, um, experimentation, uh, approaching history a little bit like a science. Uh, simulation, uh, experimentation, what I call zeitgeist, the, well, you know, it's a, the spirit of the times in German. And I think it gives depth and it gives extra context to the story. Uh, I spent some time in a um, M18 tank destroyer out in Utah just to get a feel for it. Uh, I think it helps me with my writing a little bit better to imagine what these guys were doing inside of these vehicles, what they felt like. Uh, I did not know that there were two ways to shoot these, that you had actually a pedal trigger and there was also, if that didn't work since that was an electric mechanism to fire it, there was also just a manual uh, handle that you would turn down, and it would fire that 76-millimeter uh, gun. And I actually got to fire this thing. This is one of the few World War II vehicles that is actually, you can fire it. So it was taken down to this, this quarry that we had here in Utah, and the owner of this thing, Josh Coates, he said, go ahead and fire a round out of it. Now, let me tell you, that was exciting. For a school teacher? Come on. <laughs> you know, I, I can go into my class and I can tell my students, I fired a World War II tank. You know. And then down here, the, you know, I wanted to see the inside of one of these Stugs, these Mark III Stugs, and see what they were like. And so I traveled to a, a collection out in California. And um, representation, I know Leo does a lot of this too, sometimes building terrain maps to try and get an idea of 
of what this actual terrain looks like in three dimensions. And as far as the zeitgeist, in case some of you were wondering uh, what that is all about, um, coming up with an understanding of the times. Uh, for myself, of course, being a child of the 60s and the 70s, you know, uh, having no clue about the culture of uh, the greatest generation, the 40s. And this kind of sparked a real interest that I still have today in the music and the culture. And it was kind of sparked by a comment that Tony D'Angelo had made. And I asked him, did your tank destroyer have any particular name? Knowing how much GIs like to name their vehicles or their aircraft during, you know, the war. And, and he said, yeah, it was called No Love, No Nothing. And I said, well, what did that mean? He says, I don't know. One of the guys in our, our crew came up with it, and we painted it on the side of our tank destroyer. So I did a little bit of research, and of course, I imagine many of you know LMA Morse and the song No Love, No Nothing, which came out in 1943. It was on the hit parade. Uh, and now I'm a huge big band swing music fan, too. I love this stuff. So conclusions. Um, I'm not trying to be kind of a, a, a jerk here, but I, I'm going to say the conclusions are in the book. And if you, you read the book, you know, here's the map, and it shows you the, the, the fine detail that, that Leo and I went through to kind of represent and find exactly what happened in this climactic tank battle that happened outside of Bastogne. So one thing I would like to say is, is my role as an educator, historian, and author, I feel that I am indeed passing on a legacy. And I, I want you all to know that, especially the World War II veterans that are, that are here. Uh, people like Leo and myself, we want to make sure that this legacy is passed on. I know I've talked to a bunch of veterans, and they're like, please, you know, it seems like people are forgetting what has happened, what we went through, and our sacrifices we made. Without these veterans, the story of No Silent Night could not have been completely told. We all owe these men an incredible debt not just for the sacrifices during Christmas or during the Battle of the Bulge, but for everything their generation did uh, for our nation. Thank you very much. We'll start out with our veterans. Now, both of them were in Bastogne. Neither of them participated in the exact battle that was described earlier, but they were both in Bastogne. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Jim Carroll, um, why don't you just give us a little bit of background of uh, where you were from and how you got to be a paratrooper? Three of my buddies and me, we were thinking about where we wanted to serve when we was called up in the draft. So we went one Friday night, we went to a movie, and it showed the training of U.S. Army paratroopers. And, oh golly, that was great. That's just what we was wanting, uh, our choice of units to join. So we decided on Monday morning we would meet at a certain corner and go down and join as a group. So I got up down there at 6 o'clock that morning, on a Monday morning, and, uh, and I waited and waited. <laughs> I, was, I was the only one that showed up. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll go down and join them myself, which I did. Went down the recruiters, signed up, the next day, they sent me to St. Louis, Missouri, and officially swore me into the Army. And I was there one day, and that day, I was peeling spuds. <laughs> and uh, I thought I'd never want to see another potato in my life. You sit there peeling spuds all day. But anyway, the next day, they sent me to Camp Tacoa, Georgia, that's in north uh, western part of Georgia is a special airborne training camp. It's not there anymore. But anyway, uh, from there I took my 16 weeks of basic training and then was sent to uh, Fort, Fort Benning. Uh, Benning. Fort Benning, Georgia 
which is a great training center for paratroopers. And after we practice all the obstacles and platforms and harnesses, uh, we was ready to make our jump out of the airplane. It, it, you, you made four daylight jumps and one night jump, but at that time, we had to pack our own parachute for the first three jumps. They had instructors and show us how to pack a parachute. So evidently, most of us did a good job because uh, <laughs> I didn't see anyone turning it in for a new one. But, so we uh, went, marched out to the airfield and we got on this C-47. That was the type of airplane they used in those days as a two-engine uh, uh, plane. And uh, as we was getting on the plane, being nervous for our first jump, I noticed a big puddle of, of fluid by one of the wheels of the airplane. And I never thought much about it, but uh, I got a whiff of it when I was getting on the plane, and it smelled like brake fluid to me. But I didn't say anything. I should have. But we were taxiing down the taxiway, and they had planes parked on both sides of the taxiway down to the main pair, main uh, landing strip. And uh, as the pilot was taxiing down between all these planes, he put the brakes on to turn, make a left turn onto the runway, preparing to take off. And one wheel locked up. He only had brakes on one wheel. And it swung the plane out around in a 180 degree uh, circle and it smashed into another airplane that was parked near the uh, airfield runway. And I thought, boy, is this an omen? And what's going to happen next? So, okay, Jim, um, we got to get to Bastogne. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So Jim graduated from jump school successfully. He went with a, deployed to the 101st to England. He jumped into Normandy, fought through the Normandy campaign, uh, went back to England. Then uh, on uh, the 17th of September, he jumped into Holland, spent 60 days in Holland. Uh, Herb, you had a very different path into the Airborne. So do you want to briefly tell us what your path was? Well, uh, I arrived in uh, England, and we were just replacements in the Corps of Engineers. And uh, one day, uh, we were out drinking beer, hot beer, in a hot English pub. And uh, my buddy said, you know, we got to get out of this outfit. The last guys, you know, some other guys that are back in the barracks are talking about shooting their toe off and doing kinds of things like that to get out of the combat. And I said, you're right. He said, they're going to sign up for the Airborne and, uh, tomorrow morning in, uh, in uh, the, day ca the, the day room. So we went up. I, I volunteered for the 101st, and my my buddy, L.A. Chase, we had both gotten stripes to be electricians in the in the Army, and they offered him a co corporal stripes right away, and I said, no thanks. I want to go into a rifle company. So he went to Berlin, sold Mickey Mouse's to, watches to the Russians, and I went to Bastogne. <laughs> okay. Bad. Bad timing. Okay. <laughs> but you, you went to jump school at the school in, in Britain. Yeah, I, I went to jump school in, uh, in England. And, uh, oh, wait. And, yeah, in yeah. England. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking it might and, have been. And that was in the fall of 44. Fall of 40, 40, yeah. 44, yeah. Okay. So, go ahead. So, so you joined the 101st in Mormillon, France. They, well, they had, you were well, waiting well, for them when they came out of Holland. Of Reims, Marmalon, mm -hmm. yes. Yep, yep. You were waiting for them when they came out of Holland. And uh, they came back in the end of November. So, Jim, you, you'd been in combat in Normandy. You'd been in combat in Holland. 
and you're pulled out around uh, the very last, uh, very end of November. You come back to Mormolon. What was the condition of the division? What, what were you guys thinking about when you came into Mormolon, France? When we left uh, Holland, our morale wasn't too good because we realized that we didn't do the job we set out to do, so they pulled all of our troops out of Holland. And uh, uh, like Doug said, we ended up in Mormolon, France. And uh, the way we got word about something big happening was that we were invited. I don't know if it was the whole division of the Hearn First or <laughs> Company C, which I was in, to a celebration in Mormolon, and they carted us in, in trucks, and we were partying there, and and it got to be eight or nine o'clock in the evening, and uh, all of a sudden we hear these jeeps running up and down the street with. Uh, uh, with sound systems on them, advising all troopers to get back to camp as soon as possible. And uh, we all rush back to our rides back to camp, and uh, we got the word there, uh, get your gear together and all the heavy clothes you can put on because we're going on a, a trip. Okay, Jim. Um uh, Herb, what what was your now? You're you're waiting for the 101st when they came back. You're a replacement, waiting to waiting to join the unit. Yeah. So and I, I was. What uh, was your view of, of these guys coming back out of Holland, and what was your expectations? Well, you know, I was an absolute green recruit. Um, I, you know, and I had I had been through jump school, but that was about it. But it always, I was always amazed at how I was treated. There was no hazing, there was nothing. And I began to realize they were damn glad that they had replacements because they'd gotten shot up pretty well in Holland and they needed more bodies. And so I was lucky enough to get in a, a bunk, uh, alongside a bunk with a guy by the name of McClung who happened to be the best shot in the whole damn army, I think. In fact, I buried a dead crowd on a couple of days after Christmas and he had one hole in his hand and two in his heart. <laughs> that, was, that was the mark marksman. Mar and uh, Mac was a an Indian from the north northeast corner, northwest corner of Oregon. So, and what what was what was the division doing in those two weeks in early December in Mormolon? Oh well, a lot a lot of them were in up in in went to Paris, uh, and then th that's where of course they got called out. Then that, but I I was lucky to to bunk next to McClung, who was a a real a real neat guy, I tell you. One of it, it was one that uh, I still respect to this day. He just passed away a couple of years ago. So okay. Anyhow. Okay, Jim, you you mentioned how you got no Herb, keep the mic. Jim, you mentioned how you got the word about something going on up north. Herb, what what were you doing, and where did you get the word that something was happening in Belgium? Uh, I I was uh, we were in reserve in uh, Marmelon Le Grand. And in fact, a little side story, I was going to go to, I'm a Catholic, and I was going to go to Reims Cathedral, which would be a great thing for Christmas, for Christmas Mass. And I got a, I got a lot of, uh, I got the, our company sergeant to give me some money I hadn't been paid in seven months, and things like that. So that we never made because we went the exact, exact opposite direction. Instead of going to Paris, we went up into Basson, so. <clears throat> okay, Jim, um, you were starting to talk about uh, your preparations for going up into the bulge. And can you talk about what, what you had? Did they have adequate supplies of ammunition? Did you have what, well, what we you had, thought were going to be adequate winter clothes? We had plenty of ammunition, but what we needed was winter clothes. We didn't have much of that. And uh, there wouldn't be much time to 
supply us with winter clothes because they had to get up there and plug the hole in the lines and hold the Germans off. So uh, we just put on as much clothes as we could get on and uh, we were really bundled up with uh, summer clothes and you didn't, I tried to carry a couple pair of dry socks underneath my shirt so they'd be dry because we lost a lot of uh, troopers up there due to frostbite. They get their boots wet and they take them off and not thinking that they's going to freeze up in a hurry and a lot of those troopers couldn't get their boots back on. They got frostbitten. So Jim, you, you didn't have an overcoat when you went up? No, I didn't have an overcoat. Long johns? Yeah, I had a pair of long johns. Okay. And, uh, and, uh... So at, at the beginning... Regular combat. Yeah. At, at the beginning right. of the bulge, the weather was a lot like it was outside today. So that's, that's, that's what he's talking about in the preparations. It got colder later. Um, Herb, what about, what about you? What were your preparations? Now, you're, you're a green troop. Absolutely. And Absolutely. were you getting advice from anybody, or what, what <laughs> no were your preparations? One, no one said a word. I think they were just glad that we, they had a warm body to fill some as a replacement. Right, but as far as your preparations for going up to Bastogne... There, there was none. I mean, we, we, they said I had just been... I had been in the outfit about 10 days, and uh, one, one more night, about 8 o'clock on a Sunday evening, uh, Sergeant uh, Taylor came in and he said, we're going up. And, and I, I turned to Mac McClung. I said, what the hell does he mean? He says, we're going back into combat. And they had only been out about, I think, about 15 days at the time, and they had been 70 days on the line up in Holland. So it, it wasn't a very pleasant thing. But, uh, you know, I, I always think about the, the, I was so lucky to get into a company like E Company. Mm -hmm. I mean, my God, they were... They were paratroopers. They, right. they, it, it, it was an amazing thing to see what, when they, when we got the word that we're going up, the things, the whole attitude of the company just changed overnight. Bang! The next morning we were out and they were ready to go and they were going. And I, I know my people would think did, I'm, did I'm you given uh, prevaricating, but I'm not. They were ready to go back into combat. And did you have winter clothes? Now, I yeah, well, I had an issue of stuff that I got to, you know, it was an, uh, and so when I went, when I when I uh, uh, got uh, when we went up, I had been pretty well uh, resupplied. But a lot of the guys that came from Holland didn't. They, it was because I, I got all my stuff in uh, in England, and they didn't re resupply. So they had boots, jump boots, but no no. Uh, uh, galoshes or rubbers or anything like that and that was one of the reasons why there was so much uh, frostbite because all they had was their jump boots well j jump boots got wet in no time at all so you were better supplied than Jim oh yeah and, and oh, you were better. you were an ammo bearer on a machine gun team yeah did you guys yeah. have plenty of ammo yeah that's all we had <laughs> okay <laughs> lots of ammo and stuff you know but no no clothing no extra boots no nothing like mm -hmm. that and jim i understand that they they brought in a whole fleet of limousines from paris to drive you guys into bastogne yes uh, they were more like cattle trucks <laughs> and we packed in there like sardines and most of us were standing up on the whole trip into uh, Belgium. I don't remember how many miles it was from Mormelon to Bastogne, but it seemed like an eternity. But uh, uh, as we were driving along headed for Bastogne, it started snowing, and then the winter progressively got worse. It sleeted and it rained and the highways froze, and I even saw tanks cartwheeling down these steep hills over there in Bastogne. They only had the rubber treads, and, and they had no control once those big tanks started uh, 
down the hill, and the engineers were blowing the tr big trees down along the roadway to uh, to uh, block the Germans in, in in case they got through. They did have to move those trees out of the way before they could c continue their attack or counterattack. Mm -hmm. And Herb, uh, no no tops on the trucks. You want to talk about your ride a little bit? Yep. Uh, we we uh, left uh, Marmalon Le Grand on on Monday morning. I think what the maybe the seventeenth of of uh, December, <clears throat> and we got to the intersection of the road that says Bastogne one way, and uh, Foy, um, and then another town out the other way. And we were right at that at that uh, cross section of the roads. And all of a sudden, I started. I had just said to one of the machine gunner, I said, "What's a What's a burp gun sound like? And he looked at me and laughed and he said, you'll know soon enough. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden I heard burp, burp. And I, okay, Frankie, I know now. <laughs> so the next thing was a, a whole, I would say maybe 50 to 100 GIs running, coming our way. A lot of them didn't have helmets. A lot of them didn't have weapons. No, a lot of guys, no overcoats, no nothing. Just running. And I'll never forget my, my platoon sergeant, or platoon leader, Ed Shames, who's still an active colonel as of today. He stood in the arm, he stood out in front and put his weapon up and said, stop. And he started taking weapons away from guys that were just absolutely useless. They were, they were carrying one another. It was a, it was, I hope no, no one ever has to see what I saw was an American army in retreat. And it was unbelievable to believe, to, to, to experience that. And uh, my, my lieutenant and a couple others were standing the guys with, with the guns. They were had guns pointed at them to stop and get them. And then they'd start issuing weapons. And if guys were capable or were coherent, they turn them around and they try and get there because we had all of the people that were out in front of Bastogne up th through the Ardennes. It had been overrun, and they had just a lot of them didn't have helmets for, for uh, nothing, just nothing. They were running, and a couple of our officers got them stopped and so forth. And then they were our they were our replacements in Bastogne. But that was a, uh, as I have often said in other talks. I saw an army, American army, in retreat. So. Jim, Jim, what what did you see? What was your arrival in Bastogne like? Well, we uh, once we got into Bastogne, they started deploying uh, uh, around crossroads, anything that uh, the Germans could use. We would. Uh, uh, block it one way or the other to, to slow the re, uh, the attack down, and uh, we dug dug in along uh, main intersections and uh, all the roads that went into Bastogne. Uh, we've covered as many as we could, and uh, then we held there. Uh, for I don't know how many days, but uh, the one thing that always amazed me, and I could never figure it out, we got a hot Christmas dinner. Okay, Jim, let's let's come back to that in a okay. little bit, okay? But uh, let's talk about. You mentioned your you dug your foxhole. Describe your foxhole. What was the fighting position in 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 your sector in the Battle of the Bulge, and what was the ground like? We were down in the south. Western part of Bastogne, and uh, not too far from downtown uh, Bastogne, but uh, we were dug in along a cemetery, and I remember a German plane came over and it dropped a bomb, and that thing come whistling down, making the awfulest sound, and it hit the wall of the cemetery. It never did explode, 
but I wasn't going to go out and find out why. <laughs> well, well, what was your foxhole like? Were you uh, one-man position, two-man position? Mine was big enough for two, but I was the only one in there. Mm -hmm. and, and how did you keep yourself warm in, in a foxhole? Just hunker down and think about a good hot stove, a good hot drink, uh, just about anything. Uh, I can. I thought about my dear John letter I got. <laughs> yeah, it made you hot under the collar. Uh, yeah. No, I was kind of resentful <laughs> because I was being true to my girl. She wasn't true to me. <laughs> I had a buddy back home, couldn't get in the service because he had a gimpy knee, but uh, he could run as hard as any of us guys, and, and he is tough, and uh, he wrote me a letter and told me that Betty Joe wasn't being very true to you, so I, I wrote a letter and asked her about, she wrote back and said, she didn't want to be engaged anymore, so that took care of that. But that worked out good because I married a wonderful Minneapolis girl <laughs> a few years later. And Herb, how how about you? Can you describe your fighting position? And you you were you were in the uh, you were north of Jim's position, and you were in a yeah. forest. We were, we were about a thousand yards out of Foy on a road that ran, ran from Foy to, uh, I don't know, to the, to the east toward Germany, or to the west rather, toward uh, east, yeah, east toward Germany. Yeah. So, uh, right, right there. Yeah, um, my recollection of all that, I think that w the most vivid thing that that happened to me in that early stage is we got off the trucks and we were uh, in combat immediately the burp guns were in audible range guys were running at us with no weapons no covert coats no nothing it was an an american army in retreat and i hope none of you ever have to see that cuz we none of us you know an airborne has a, a lot of esprit de corps we couldn't believe what we were seeing, and our and suddenly our then our our company uh, platoon leader began to stop the guys, sit them down, give them weapons, and cool them off, and turn them back around to to start to get. But they were really totally uh, two guys carrying a wounded guy on a rifle on rifle butts and things like that. But Herb, talk talk about your fighting position. You were on a machine gun. Crew. No, I was yeah, I was an ammo carrier on a on a machine gun, and of course I was a replacement, so I got the you know the lowest job on around, and uh, that was it didn't it didn't last very long because unfortunately, I was sent out to pick up some KIAs out of another hole, and uh, the uh, well let's see uh, the, yeah I went out to pick up the KIAs when I came back, the machine gunners were dead. So I was I was lucky. They, the the Krauts had picked them off, and there was there were two guys left. I was the third guy, the ammo carrier, and I had gone someplace else. Mm -hmm. So that was my beginning of luck, and uh, I, I, that's some a lot of little things like that happened. So I how, did go ahead. How, yeah. how did how did you keep warm? What did you do? I. You were you were better dressed than Jim. You had yeah, because I kept, I'd come. Well, I came from England. Mm -hmm. So how did what did you do to keep warm in your hole? Well, you could you kept moving your legs and arms and everything and just as much as you you could and that, and that it was amazing how how that worked out because I don't know if you've ever heard but it got 20 below zero some nights in 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 Bastogne and it, <laughs> you, there was no way you could stay warm so you just stay and we we slept in layers of two guys on the bottom and two guys ahead and then after two hours the, the, the top layer went to the bottom layer and, the, and, and two other guys got to be cold 
And that was what, what we had for trying to stay warm. And I remember uh, trying to uh, heat a cup of coffee in the morning. And you know, and, and you hated to do it because guess what? There was a little smoke with the coffee. And guess what the smoke brought? <laughs> Mortar fire. <laughs> So anyhow, but we, we, all, we lived through that. And, and I, I think there were a number of guys that were ev evacuated for frostbite. Mm -hmm. I had played hockey outside in the wintertime in Chicago. And I lived in the Chicago area. So I knew it was what I felt sorry were for the southern guys who had never seen ice or snow or anything. And they, they, they just, I don't know how some of them didn't shake themselves to death. They were so cold. Mm -hmm. It was really, it was really tough. So, okay. 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 Despite Jim, Jim mentioned something earlier. We're going to get back to it. But despite the hardships and everything, the American Army always goes to war with a tremendous logistical system supporting it. And Eisenhower wanted everybody to get a hot meal at Christmas time, turkey when they could get it. So here's these guys in Bastogne, and they're surrounded. And Jim, what did you get for Christmas? Go, give, give him the mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, here comes a, uh, uh, a, a jeep up the road, and uh, they had a bunch of uh, big pots on the, the side of the jeeps, and they was going along there, and, and they was telling everybody, get your mask gear out, and, and as that jeep was going along, they'd shovel out some dressing, some turkey, and, and potatoes, and sweet potatoes. It, it was like a regular gift to get a hot meal, because we didn't have hardly anything when we went left France because they didn't have the supplies to equip, you know, with uh, just the necessary things like ammo and and uh, medical kits and stuff like that. Has turkey ever tasted so good? Anything would have tasted good. <laughs> Herb, you, you had a different experience. For <laughs> as dinner. long as it was hot. <laughs> yeah. there, was, there was a dead kraut laying out in front of our holes about 100 yards, and Shames, Shames said to me, uh, why don't you go out and see what he's got there? So by God, I ate Christmas dinner on his, on his frozen chest, but the meat was good. <laughs> and where, where did the meat come from? From the, from the dead kraut. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Now, just before Christmas, there was an aerial resupply that you guys received in Bastogne. Mm -hmm. Did you did you see that at all? And and how did your situation change after some supplies were dropped in? Well, the trouble was that, from my recollection, and Ray Ray Noble, if he's in the crowd here tonight, it dropped right out in front of his his uh, position, his uh, uh, 75 position. But it was out in the open field between our, our lines and Noville, or not Noville, Foy. And Foy was in crowd hands. So a lot of that stuff that dropped there, we could not get to, because it would you know, be picked up by snipers or something. So uh, we, we really never got any real good supply until I think right after Christmas, when they had, well, it was, uh, yeah, it was uh, the day after Christmas, I believe, they broke through. And then we began to get some supplies and so forth. Jim, you were kind of on the opposite end of the, uh, opposite end of the perimeter from the, dro from the, from the drop zone. What, what, how did your situation change after the aerial resupply, or didn't it? Never even heard an airplane, except that German fighter went over by the cemetery. But... Uh, uh, like I say, we didn't have time to get supplied with uh, uh, rations when we left uh, uh, France on the way to Bastogne. And uh, you manage, uh, you know, we stuffed a bunch of these, uh, uh, I think, sea rations. The little boxes that have a can of sardines in them or 
uh, some garbage <laughs> is what I thought of them. But uh, uh, you get, when you get hungry, you, you can go a long way without eating. We knew eventually uh, things would change, which they do, but uh, it's hard It's hard to keep a stiff upper lip in those conditions. Did, did you eventually get some winter clothing? No. Never got a thing until the war ended in Bastogne. Hmm. We went in there with the clothes we had on, and we came out of there with the clothes we had on. <laughs> so we were pretty filthy by then. And uh, in dire need of a good bath. But... Uh, Patton's, Patton's Third Army broke through on the 26th, the day after Christmas. Right. And after that happened, you had a special visitor, and it wasn't Santa. <laughs> you want to tell that story? Sure. My brother was with Patton's 4th Armored Division. They're the ones that broke the ring around Bastogne. And my brother always knew where the Hearn 1st Airborne was because he wanted to take care, care of his little brother. And uh, so they had a couple hours layover in Bastogne while they refueled and resupplied because, you know, they had to resupply every once in a while, too. And those tanks use up a lot of fuel. And uh, he had a couple hours, and uh, he started inquiring. He knew the Hearn Air Force, Hearn First Airborne was in Bastogne, and he started inquiring and, and uh, did stop a trooper and say, you know where C Company is? No. And he'd go to another one. He finally ran across a trooper that knew where C Company was. And he said, you know Jim Carroll? And the trooper says, no, I don't believe so. And uh, he said, but there's a bunch of uh, troopers down that road there. You might ask them. So my brother went down there. and. By golly, one of the guys he talked to knew me. And he says, oh, Jimmy's down there at the end of the road there and in a foxhole. So my brother went down there and he jammed his rifle down in my ribs. <laughs> I was half asleep. Yeah. And I looked up and that's how my brother saved me. <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> But my retort was that uh, we had everything under control. <laughs> we don't need you. <laughs> but it was a wonderful sight to see those big tanks coming up the road. And Herb, you, you have a Ray Nagel story. Ray, you want to stand up and take a bow? This is about you. No, no, you don't have to say anything. Just stand up and let people cheer you. Okay, there you go. Okay. No, no, just, just yeah, that's, that's fine, yeah. Okay, so here's a Ray Nagel story now. Okay. From an infantryman's point of view. Ray was an artilleryman. It was a bright and early uh, morning, uh, sunshine, and we'd had, a, we'd had a drop of resupply. But in, a, in that same period, uh, a, a crowd light light tank came up and pointed his artillery piece right at Ray's position, and Ray returned fire. And I'll still I still remember this: the shell hitting the front of that. I think it was a light German tank because nothing heavy could get into those into those deep snow and so forth. They'd get lost. And I still remember that shell going off the front of that tank and up in the air. And boy, that tank put it, it rotated his it rotated his artillery piece to the to the rear and took off. <laughs> 
So he, he didn't knock out the tank, but he chased him away. <laughs> so anyhow. So Jim, you you were you had a blessed time. You you were never wounded in the in the hundred and first. No, I wasn't. And and uh, you served with them till the end of the war, ended up down by Berchtesgarten on occupation duty before you came home. But uh, Herb, you weren't so lucky. No. And you want to talk about your one particular bad day. Yeah, uh, I had, uh, I was, uh, uh, that particular day I was working uh, stretcher carrier and so forth for the aid station. And uh, I had been sent to the aid station uh, with a couple of wounded guys, or one wounded on a stretcher, and a couple stretcher carriers. And a new unit just in from Antwerp. They had gotten off, the, came down the gangplanks, and they came right to the front, which was about 60 miles from Antwerp. I'm not exactly that sure, but somewhere in there. And they were up on the brow of a hill that was maybe where that black line ends up there and we were down below and the aid station was down below and the tanks got up there and their engines are running so they, the crowds already had a sound thing on them you know as far as they knew about where they were and about where they were uh, located and someone on a tank lit a cigarette now it was a black moonless night absolute no moon no artillery fire going on nothing else and within 30 seconds 188 came wham right in it hit the brow of the hill like there and i was standing just below it killed four guys and i'm here alive to talk about it today but you had a pretty severe wound oh yeah i had a little shell fragment about that big around went through both my femurs so I spent uh, nine months in bed, 18 months in the hospital. But talk a little bit about your evacuation and what you remember from that. Well, uh, I'm saying, oh, oh, okay. I, uh, I, la I was what, taken. What, first, first the medic. What, what the medic, what do you, what, what did the medic, you over, you, you were conscious the whole time. Oh yeah, I yeah. was conscious the so whole time. Talk about what the medics are saying and. Well, they put me in a snow pile because I was bleeding and all I had was a couple little tiny holes in both lives. One piece of femur, a piece of uh, shrapnel entered my right femur and came out the other side of my left femur. So both my legs were absolutely shattered. I've got a bone laying around here somewhere that anyone wants to see it. <laughs> and the shell, you can see right where the little tiny fragment of, of uh, shell hit hit the femur and went through both of them. And the bone, the chunk of bone is about that big in that quarter. And I remember the doctor, they came to my bed because I was in what they call skeletal traction. And that meant both legs were up in the air. But, but before that, you're in the field hospital and you're talking to the doctor. Oh, 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 <laughs> oh, oh, that part, yeah. See, you spent, you spent the whole afternoon in the car with me. I know your story better than you do. <laughs> See? Maybe I was lying a little. <laughs> no, uh, the doctors, uh, it was a, a two-bed, <laughs> two-stretcher hospital, and uh, they were operating, you know, back and forth, just like Matt. It looked just like Matt. <laughs> uh, so anyhow, uh, he, uh, the doc they were all scrubbed. And they were standing there, the orderly was about ready to give me ether. And I looked at him and I said, because I knew I had bad wounds. And I said, are you going to take my legs off? And they said, no trooper, we don't. And I said, you're not shitting me, are you? <laughs> Pardon the expression, but I want to keep it absolutely right. And they, they said no. And the next morning I woke up in the evac hospital and that is probably the most memorable thing that I carry with me all the time was at evac hospital. Guys were dying right and left, half of their skulls gone, nurses running back and forth trying to save people's lives. It was to say the least gruesome and I remember that next morning uh, when I began to be a little bit coherent and so forth 
And I thought, my God, I, I'm sorry, but I'll tell you exactly what it was. I mean, or how it, I woke up and I said, my God, I don't know if I have my legs. And a nurse went flying by me and I said, nurse, take those blankets off my toes. And I didn't know if I had any toes. So uh, he lifted them up, lift up the blankets, and there's, I wiggled those 10 toes. And I think I went back to sleep for about 24 hours. <laughs> so, and then it was nine months and before I went, I put my feet on the floor. So, anyhow. Okay. Um, thank you very much, guys. And uh, we have time for questions. I can't see your uh, French medal, Jim. You have it on tonight? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Tell us about that. Forgot what they call it. Legion of Honor. Yeah. <laughs> Legion of Honor uh, by the French government for thanking American personnel or any non-citizen of France. That's the highest non-citizen award you can get, and you got to be alive to get it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's not, they don't give too many of them out, and uh, uh, I'm uh, thankful for uh, France for bestowing it upon me and I accepted it in for all the buddies that I lost in the war so it's not just for me but it's for all my buddies that did as much as I did in during the war in France so do you want the mic do you want the mic if uh, any of you have any relatives or good friends who ha are army nurses, I would not be saying and talking today if it hadn't been for army nurses to come when the medications ran out and they'd come and hold my hand at night. And that was, that was it. That was my comfort. And believe me, uh, I can't. Yeah, you know, they, they were incredible women, incredible, trying to deal with guys who had their heads half their brain uh, hanging out and, oh, you know, in back, evac hospital. It's probably uh, one of the worst things that I think that I went through, even with my own wounds, was what, was what came into that hospital and how they handled it. And, and you know, that, it was uh, just amazing. That, the dedication that those nurses had, and then the VAC hospital was that. That's where the, the first when you're first wounded, that's where you go. And man, that is a nightmare of a place to be serving and medically trying to give help to people. So, how old were both of you at the time of Bastogne? I enlisted at 18, and I was probably about 19 and a half, I guess. I was, yeah, I I, I had real good duty. I was. I was condemned to New York, downtown New York City during New Year's Eve of 1944. <laughs> no, not 44, you were in Bastogne. Oh, Bastogne, yeah, 43. 43, 43. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. yeah, you're correct, correct. Jim, how old were you? I joined at 18, and I stayed with the troopers for three years when they discharged me from the army after the war in Europe ended. We were destined to go to the South Pacific, the Hearn first, but the war ended when they dropped the bomb over in Japan, so we were all happy about that. I'm just curious about if the two of you, um, when did you start to talk about what you experienced? And then the second question, do you have any advice for families for how to ask veterans about their story? Did you have any trouble or did you delay talking about the war or anything? And then what recommendations do you have for families talking to their veterans? Uh, right after I was wounded, uh, I'd wake up occasionally at night and I'd be falling. But 
the, after after a little while that went away and it's never been a, I've never had post traumatic and believe me when I realized the seriousness of my wounds and the decision that could have been made to take both of them off both of my legs off I look back at that and I say my god what that me those medical personnel had to put up with during that period and what they did with so little real uh, support it was incredible. So. Jim? It was very f few times that uh, my brother and I would discuss what happened during the war because we both lost a lot of good friends and when I think about them I shed a tear because I met some wonderful lads in my battles with the troopers and uh, some it just doesn't seem right that they take all the young guys off to war and they get all they get killed and and they maybe they should be start taking some of the older people <laughs> could you turn around and tell how your dad started talking about uh, his experiences well, I was in my late teens or early 20s and we always went ice fishing. And one time Dad and I were out on the lake, I'm assuming Mille Lacs, and he had a portable ice house. And it was made of a black rubber and I asked him what was that out of and I believe he said a friend of his made it and it was like out of World War II life preservers or something like that. Yeah, and when he said World War II, I just remember I just started asking questions and he talked about D-Day and we had, I don't think we caught one fish. <laughs> but after all that, I remember asking him, I go, well, why didn't you talk about the war before? And he said, well, nobody asked me. <laughs> so it took me to grow up a little to remember and go catch up on my history. So. Come and talk to Anita about that. <laughs> Herb? Yeah. Um, so your first time in battle is some of the most severe fighting in the Battle of the Bulge, and I just wanted you to talk a little bit about what it was like for you your first time in combat, maybe the first four or five days in combat, in that uh, first time bullets are coming at you, just how you remember that whole experience. I, I'll go back just a little bit before that. Uh, we, we came out of Marmelon Le Grand. I was supposed to go on leave to, and I was planning on going Christmas Eve to Mass at Reims Cathedral, and instead we were on our way to Bastogne. But uh, anyhow, I, during that period, you know, doggone, I lost my train of thought here. Uh, the first days in combat, what was okay, the experience? Okay, first days of combat. Well, my first days of combat were an Amer American Army in retreat. And that, that is something that I hope that Americans never have to see again. There were hundreds of guys running at us, GIs, with no helmets, no over overcoats, uh, some with no boots. I think they were running in the snow because they had been overrun by a couple of uh, German divisions. And it was the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge, and that's where it started up in the, in the far north on the Ardennes, on the end of the Ardennes, uh, Ardennes area. So I, uh, that's my most vivid, is seeing literally hundreds of guys running down this road. And right behind it, and that's when I made the f remark that I think I mentioned a little earlier that uh, uh, I asked uh, 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 Frankie Mellet uh, what a birth gun sounded like, and he said, oh, you'll, soon, you'll hear soon enough or you'll know soon enough in about three minutes later. Brip, brip, brip. He said, see what I mean? <laughs> so, Jim, uh, one time you shared with me your experience when you first landed in Normandy when you were assembling your equipment and you were under attack by some dark black objects. You want to share that with everybody? When we jumped on D-Day in Normandy, I lit right next to a little canal and uh, it was full of water and uh, before that a lot of our troopers drowned because the Germans had flooded some of the lowlands in that area 
of Normandy and and we had so much equipment on us that if you lit in the water you'd sink like a lead sinker and you would no way you could get out of your equipment in time to save yourself from drowning but anyway the first thing you do when you hit the ground is get out of the harness your parachute harness because they're constricting and uh, uh, and uh, just a little lower there you go and uh, the next thing you do is you get your firearm ready for firing and I was on my knees and I had a, a Durand rifle that it was field stripped it was in a pack beneath my reserve chute and we could put that rifle together in less than 10 seconds, so three pieces. And uh, anyway, I got my rifle ready and I see these dark shapes coming up. Uh, it, it was nighttime, you know, and, uh, and uh, uh, I l squinted my eye and I said, those don't look like human beings. And uh, they got closer and I made it out. It was a herd of cattle headed for me you know a whole herd of them that was cattle country you know in in normandy also and uh i started waving my arms and they veered off to my left and uh after that i uh saw the outline against the dark sky of the hedgerow uh, those hedgerows in uh france they use them for fences they make mounds of dirt and then they plant hedges on top of them they make excellent fences well anyway i headed for that it seemed like i was the only one down there i didn't see another one of my uh squad uh, there and uh, uh we had these crickets that we used for challenging and uh I got over in that hedgerow and I heard a noise in the hedge and I clicked my cricket and I got about a dozen answers. <laughs> <laughs> so I crawled in there with the rest of the troopers and that's what we was waiting on is to get a force big enough to be effective. So what you do if uh, your squad leader isn't with you, you pick out uh, if uh, there's an officer there he usually decides what objective we should go to and uh, if it no officers then a ranking nco non-commissioned officer would uh, take over and he'd decide what objective we'd go to and uh, he picked out a bridge that we should go defend because uh, uh, going back a bit, Bert here, he was telling about the retreating Americans. Well, you know, in Normandy, we had no place to run because there's Germans on both the front and both the rear. The Germans were trying to get to the beaches and the Americans landing on the beaches were driving the Germans inland right at us. So we had Germans on both sides of us and there's no place to run even if we could. But uh, anyway, uh, that was our job was to, to block any fresh enemies from getting to our troops and uh, which we did and uh, and that was our job once the regular infantry catches up with us they'd pull us out and send us back to resupply and uh, get ready for the next operation which was market garden we did some mop up in Cherbourg for a few days because there's some pockets of Germans there that they didn't want to give up, so we had to uh, get rid of them.
for Jim and Herb, but just that last segment that you're talking about, Jim, and about your, about, I guess, probably many of us believe a certain victory was was about to come uh, for the Allies over Germany. Did your, uh, did your experiences at, at Stone uh, around that time, did, did you have any doubts that uh, possibly the, the war might not be won? Um, I know Herb talked a little bit about uh, seeing retreating Americans, and that was such a, a, a dismal sight. Um, so just about your belief in, uh, in being able to achieve victory during the war. Okay. The, the, the question was, did, did you ever doubt victory? Did you ever doubt that we'd win the war? No, I, I, I guess I was uh, too naive to realize what could have happened. And uh, so I, uh, and of course my, my tenure in combat was relatively short, so by the time uh, when, when I did get wounded and then spent time in the hospital, it was very, not long after that then that the war started to come our way and there wasn't much question about what was going to happen. It was just going to take a lot of time and a lot of lives. In World War II, the generals, of course, get a lot of the credit. There's a famous picture of Eisenhower interviewing and talking with the 101st Airborne troops before they, get to, before they took off. And then, of course, there's General Wedgway and General McAuliffe. Did you at any time see any of these generals? Yes. Uh, well, I saw General Patton one time. And believe it or not, he was riding in a Jeep, standing up, in that typical Patton pose with his hand on the, on the uh, windshield. And guess where he was? About 100 yards outside the, our combat uh, area at, at a place, little place called Foy, which was the first hamlet out of Bastogne. And that was, it was, Foy was in the crowd hands at that time. Why on earth? And he only, it was only his Jeep. And, I, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. I was maybe, oh, maybe 500 yards, a little more than that. There was no mistaking who I saw. <laughs> and, and a lot of people say, I oh, couldn't. I said, I'm telling you, that was such a typical pose that he couldn't have had a second doing that. Okay, if you want to hear uh, more of Herb's stories, if any of you have seen the miniseries Band of Brothers, that was his unit, that was his company, and he's one of the veterans being interviewed on that program. So it's probably far and away the best production ever done on World War II. So um, if you haven't seen it, you're missing something. Hey, about the question about interviewing veterans, um, I, I've interviewed veterans all my life, and it normally starts out with the family telling you he won't talk about it, <laughs> and then they'll talk for 10 hours. <clears throat> or three hours, or four or five hours, and then after I turn off the recorder, they, oh, I didn't tell you this story, I didn't tell you that story. Most of us never talk about our lives. How many of you go home and regale your families with stories about work, or junior high, or what it was like to raise your teenage children? You know, uh, we just don't do it, we don't talk about it. And too often when someone asks someone to tell them a story, they say, well, tell me about the war, or tell me about your childhood, what, uh, 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 where do you start? So just ask little questions. And first educate yourself about what you want them to tell you about so you can ask um, specific questions. But often it's hard, too, to interview within your own family. So sometimes it's good to get an outsider to interview, a neighbor or somebody else. But uh, I've always found veterans to be willing to talk. Um, one guy uh, was in the 82nd, made four combat jumps, and. Some of his buddies said, well, he won't talk to you, he won't talk to you. And he spent an hour on the phone talking to me about not wanting to talk to me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> unfortunately, I didn't record it. But, you know, people will talk, but it's not just veterans that have a story. Everybody has a story. You live your life, um, your time comes and you're gone, you haven't told anybody about your life, what's the point? Who's going to remember? What do you know about your great-grandparents? What will your great-grandchildren know about you? So your life contributed to, well, is contributing to what's going to be their lives, just as your great-grandparents' life contributed to making you who you are. So tell your story. You've all got one. Program tomorrow. Uh, program tomorrow at noon.
here on Patton and the Bulge. Thank you for coming. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.